Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwoko, your host, every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on the Private Property Channel. Thank you so much for watching yet another episode of the Farming Podcast. And today we've got a, such a, a, a fantastic or, a, or an exciting topic uh, at that chance. You know, you could just tell how excited I am. I can't even talk because the guest that we have today has 29 years experience within the cannabis industry. And it seems like cannabis has just been around um, for about three or two years. You know, it's such a common buzzword of late. And it's quite interesting to know that there's a person who's um, dedicated almost three decades of his life or his career in the cannabis industry. And today we're talking about licensing cannabis in South Africa. So you, if you have an interest about cannabis farming or have heard about cannabis farming and just, um, you know, quite didn't understand how do you start cannabis farming and how do you license it? How do you trade? Well, I think today's topic or episode is the right one for you. We are approaching episode 90 and I believe today's episode 89. And so, um, yeah, what a way to just move on to a, a, a next level within the farming podcast. As always, if you have any questions comments for the guest, please feel free to, um, uh, to ask a question and we're happy to respond live onto the show. So let's get right to it. And we are joined by Cornel van der Watt. Cornel, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Oh, good evening, Bali. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, good evening to all the listeners out there as well. I'm happy to be with you guys. Um, exciting talk. Likewise, I'm so excited. I mean, just off air, you're just telling me that you go by the name uh, White Lion in the industry, and I see that you're a CEO of White Lion Holdings. Firstly, Gurnal, I think uh, by means of introduction, kindly introduce yourself to our audience this evening and um, the work that you do uh, within the cannabis industry in South Africa. Yeah, so uh, uh, AKA the white lion in the cannabis industry, I uh, got doped that through many years of experience and um, extensive work in community uh, programs and um, on the international level as well. Um, I have a deep fr footprint in the cannabis cultivation uh, uh, sector. And yes, uh, for me, it's been a long journey. Uh, cannabis has always been part of my life and um, I, uh, I represent uh, white lion uh, holdings, also complete cannabis solutions, um, both mm -hmm. startup companies um, of myself. Um, we've moved on uh, through the years and are well known in the sector. I would say we're the leading cultivation group in South Africa. And um, yeah, we we represent and we help the larger scale uh, farmers, uh, people that's on a commercial and industrial scale that would like to uh, get into the cannabis sector. Uh, we get approached across the board from uh, people that's in the agricultural sector, uh, maize, cattle, uh, uh, citrus, uh, where I am in the Western Cape, we deal with a lot of the citrus uh, farmers at the moment that we actually help them. We take their hands and we give them a full turnkey solution uh, from the beginning uh, to the end. So from genetics, from application through genetics to uh, the market, and we walk them through the whole process. Right. So like I was saying in my intro, you know, uh, Cornell, cannabis farming seems to be the trend of late, you know, for the past three years or so. And you've been in this industry for 29 years. You know, um, how did you start to be in the sector? And why didn't we hear about cannabis farming in 29 years ago? Yeah, so um, I'm not going to tell him the whole story yet. It's, uh, <laughs> I'll try and put it in a nutshell. Uh, it's, a, it's been a long path for me and a, and a hard walk uh, and it, it, it's, you know, this camo clothes uh, speak for itself, uh, my uniform, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a tough, um, I refer to it as World War Wheat and uh, uh, Potelix. You know, I've been in World War Wheat and Potelix for at least the last 10 years of my life. So, um, yeah, we came from obviously an underground sector and more a, a recreational underground uh, movement into a formal and agricultural sector. And um, it's where... The underground had to take hands with uh, regulations and also move on into a commercial and production uh, 
sector, you know. So, yeah, my, my history is extensive uh, from early 90s in uh, the United States um, after I studied uh, chemical engineering. Um, I climbed into the industry, uh, came back in uh, 99, uh, brought the industry with me and also uh, the skill of glass blowing at that stage. Uh, dived into scientific glass blowing and that gave me a cutting edge in experience in extraction and so forth. Uh, got diagnosed with uh, cancer because of the glass blowing and uh, really uh, got into the health benefits from cannabis and specifically cannabis well healed my old my own uh, cancer through my own action and ingestion of uh, the oils and so forth and that was my my ticket you know that was that was just a switch in my brain and said uh, this is my future and i've never ever looked back um, helped a lot of people uh, since then um, on the health benefits of it and moved over into the more uh, professional and corporate sector of the industry as well Mm, mm. So, um, with cannabis farming, firstly, right, where can you farm cannabis in South Africa? And for a farmer who wants to go into cannabis farming, what comes first? Is this building the farm and the infrastructure to start cannabis farming or getting the license first to start cannabis farming? Yeah, so uh, right, rightfully, like you say, um, there's no restrictions to where you are allowed to grow it, like a specific province in South Africa or that. Um, it's open to the whole of South Africa. Um, at this stage, uh, it is uh, under uh, SAPRA, the South African um, uh, Regulatory Authority that deals with cannabis applications of SAPRA. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a license application to cultivate, manufacture, import cannabis for medicinal purposes. And it's an application process that you follow. It, um, it's it's a little bit, you can say, for all the situation, extensively in the suit as well. So you can put a license and you can get going. In South Africa, you have to go through quite a, a tedious process um, of establishing uh, your facility first and laying the capex out as well. Uh, so there's clear guidelines from SAPRA on how to comply uh, with the, the compliance for getting a license. And the compliance is exactly that. It's uh, putting up a facility, um, having the land to do it on uh, all the infrastructure. Um, I, the, 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 cultivate, the, the application itself is, is quite a, a simple process. It's a form that you fill in and um, it's a 23,800 rand uh, fee the last time I checked. But um, what really gets difficult then is um, after that you get queued for inspection to comply before you can get issued a license and the compliance is is is, is tedious it's 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 the hard part of it um we we help the 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 farmer or the client to actually choose the location um it's very important for me a location where to grow obviously um, if you a cannabis expert uh, you'll be able to grow cannabis anywhere in the world i can grow cannabis anywhere in the world for you but some areas is a lot more capex intensive than other areas so mm -hmm. i like to from the word go inform uh, the farmer where it will suit uh, his pocket the best to cultivate so from site selection uh, straight through to introducing the third parties you mentioned bosman van sol uh, we've paired ourselves with the best there is in the industry um, i'm backed by international brands and international names that i've worked with with for over 20 years uh the dutch guys uh the the netherlands guys are are known for their greenhouse uh, capability yeah. and their technology and they they definitely my go, my go-to when it comes to the greenhouse structures um just like that i also have a construction team that does the buildings so even with the cultivation um just for for information out there the license is for cultivation undercover that's what the license states so you got to literally put up a greenhouse or a shade net or so forth it's not for open outdoor uh, cultivation at this moment in time it is still um, undercover and it's completely regulated and uh, yeah we we put together a site master file after the application and the site master file includes everything it consists from the site layout to the processing facility uh, with all the procedures um, your equipment list of what's standing in that processing facility with the suppliers uh, all standard operating procedures with checklists for every aspect of the industry uh, service level agreements with third parties uh, that we we bring to the table as well. Um, yeah, the, the, the option of ISO regulation, double gap, which you want to con conform with uh, traceability and tracking systems. Uh, 
genetic supplier agreements, uh, offtake agreements, organogram, structure of your company, all of that. So as you can see out of, out of this, um, it is a huge barrier to entry. Um, mm. If you look at all the capital you have to spend and mm. also all the, all the intellectual property that needs for you to comply. So the majority of our clients, um, they, they take comfort in us taking their hand and uh, mitigating uh, these risks. Um, for maybe not getting a license or mitigating the risk in failing in this industry because it's not a in, uh, it's not an easy industry. Uh, a lot of people are out there uh, with misinformation and uh, get uh, let by the nose because it's the green rush, like you say. It's a it's the buzzword now. Uh, the green wave has hit South Africa now, but the rest of the world has been there. And um, uh, I was in Colorado when it happened. I was in California when it happened. I was in Canada when it happened. I was in Lesotho when it happened. The same is busy happening here. You know, it's a it's a circle of events that's turned, and um, everybody's heavily invested in the space at the moment. I I got to got to tell you the truth that. Uh, Everybody is looking at it. Uh, big pharma is looking at it. Uh, the mining industry is looking at it. Uh, um, uh, all the food and beverage companies are looking at it. Um, it's yeah. it's big business. It's big business for the future for South Africa. Right. Cool. Now, you mentioned some critical points there. I heard you speak about Lesotho. However, the connection broke a bit there, right? So basically, just to understand is that, you know, Sapra has... Um, has the guidelines, right, to get the license. You mentioned the price of the license. So if a farmer had to start a commercial production within cannabis farming, and let's say they're reaching out to uh, white line holdings, do they first look at the guidelines and build that their farm or their greenhouses in relation to the guidelines? So looking at the guidelines and you start building, you look and start building so that by the time the building or the infrastructure is done, your infrastructure speaks towards the guidelines and then you can have other certifications like Global Gap, et cetera. Is that correct? Correct. You're hitting the nail right on the head there. Um, so that's that service that we provide. So we literally take the hand and uh, we guide them through those guidelines by putting up the facility for them and doing all the paperwork for them and the side master file and then help them to get that license. And we can talk about the time frame as well and so yes. forth on how long the process takes. So um, a lot of people, like I say, they'll, there's people that say that will run around and say, oh, you, you, can, you can put up a loop house, a vegetable loop house, and you can put the two by four uh, uh, poles and a shade net and you're ready to go. But it's not the fact. Um, security is, it gets scrutinized. Uh, you got to have access control. you got to have uh, anti-climbing uh, fencing 2.4 meters high. You got to have cameras. Uh, you got to have biometrics on the doors. Um, Secure is a big aspect of it. Um, just because of the, the the nativeness of cannabis, you know, um, we we're dealing with a formal sector here, yeah, and it falls under the health sector, and um, it's about the compliance with the regulations. Um, it's mm-hmm. scheduled uh, drugs still as it stands today. The regulations hasn't changed on on uh, cannabis. So um, all those things you got to comply with. So if people try to cut corners so that it doesn't, it, it doesn't work, they, they fail. Um, mm. So yeah, you got to, you got to put faith in SAPRA as well and in the licensing process. I know there's a lot of uh, people that's against uh, the licensing process and that, but it also gives a lot of uh, faith in the process that there is actually a, a national health uh, regulatory authority that's backing uh, the process. Um, on and product development and that because it doesn't just cultivation. If uh, the first person that has to die from a cannabis-related uh, they take bad business, is bad for the whole industry. It has to be regulated. It can't be a backyard uh, mechanic situation uh, where everybody can just uh, make medicine and run it out to the market. It's got to be regulated. It's got to be registered. Um, so I don't have any problem with the process. I put my faith in the process. Um, uh, to regulate it for us and we just comply with that process. Um, our time frames, uh, best uh, scenario is uh, we do a service level agreement for three months where we help you select a site, uh, we introduce the third party uh, uh, contractors, we build the process, we build, we put up the greenhouses, we do all the paperwork and application and we hand it in and we queue for the license. Normally the bolt out would be a six to eight month process and then uh, after your application is in, you get queued for a inspection date. Uh, mm. That's your DA. Um, on that day, everything has got to be in place. So like I say, it's risky. It's a big risk to lay out the capital and mm. not 
knowing if you're going to get a license or not. But you also, I can sit here and say uh, directly to you that uh, I've never failed in getting a license um, because we're familiar with the process and we we work very closely in the process as well. And um, we know what we're doing. So, uh, yeah, we, 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 we're a professional outfit. Yeah, Cornel, this sounds so exciting and very, very technical as well. Um, you know, also, it sounds like there's so much high barriers to entry. You know, it, it reminds me of like, uh, um, you know, intensive vegetable farmers and the things that they have to go through via global gap and exporting documents, etc. Talking about licenses and what you've just explained right now in the past two minutes, um, are we on par within South Africa from a global perspective with our license? For example, what I'm trying to ask is that, you know, SAPRA is the one that um, is creating these regulations, um, also guiding farmers that if you're producing on a commercial level, you have to have a specific license and you need to pass that. So now once I've passed this, I've, I've, I've put up my infrastructure as a farmer and now I want to trade globally. I want to export from a global perspective. Is our license on par with global standards? Yes, um, that's a very good que question. So um, if you start to look at uh, GMP and uh, GAP and GACP and so forth, so we built according to uh, GAP for me is good agricultural practices where it's in the field, it's in the greenhouse, it's what you apply to your plants and the cultivation itself. Uh, mm -hmm. GACP, it's more uh, good agricultural collection practices. So how you're harvesting, how you're tracking, how you're consolidating into a batch number, how you're mm -hmm. testing, how you're storing, how you're drying and so forth. So, and then after that, you're only getting GMP. So a lot of people get misguided on the GMP side because uh, GMP is good manufacturing processes. So only once you start processing, um, everything I've mentioned so far is primary processing. For cultivation. This is a difficult part of the industry as well because we're trying to pair now uh, agricultural sector cultivation with the medical sector that's mm -hmm. very uh, medicinal orientated and very clean and very strenuous and very mm -hmm. uh, regulated. So it's a, it's a difficult part. Where do you stop with uh, GACP and where does GMP start? So mm -hmm. that uh, clarification is busy getting formulated and um, we are allowed to export and we have exported. Um, I was involved with exports uh, out of Lesotho to Canada. I was involved with exports out of South Africa to Switzerland. So the first exports out of Lesotho, we helped with. The first exports out of South Africa, we helped with and we managed those um, sites. And um, yeah, so very possible and very unstandard. I mean, uh, the GMP, if you look at GMP accreditation, we can get GMP accreditation in South Africa. It's a SAPRA GMP. Um, does that hold up with an EU GMP? Uh, no, it's not the same standards. Uh, EU GMP, uh, like everybody knows, Germany is one of the hardest countries to actually get into and get product into. So when it comes to quality assurance and quality checks and that, it's very much up to the 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 company itself to lead um, that aspect and have the professionalism and the right technicians in place to give that quality assurance and that quality and also to pair yourself with good uh, tracking and be clear and transparent to sapra about it you know so it's got to be a two-way street um, on on communication Right. We have a comment here, uh, Cornell, from JB, and they're saying there's so much blur information out there. So it's really great to hear this information from you, Cornell, and, uh, right. which is a great comment because it's nice to know that, you know, uh, it brings so much comfort speaking to someone who's very uh, experienced in the sector. And I know you all, uh, you are focused on a, a commercial or a business uh, a scale with regards to cannabis production, but as a regulatory body and as an industry, how do you then manage what people are growing in a, in a commercial farm that has a, a, a license versus what people are growing in their own individual households? Because I think the law in South Africa is that you can grow cannabis or consume cannabis, but within your own uh, you know, private uh, space. So how does one, right. as an industry or as a body, how does one uh, regulate uh, the two different um, uh, cannabis production, especially where health is concerned. 
Sure. So, um, like I say as well, um, I, like I'm sitting here, I, I, I have background of working with communities and community upliftment and I, I am a Rasta as well. So the dreadlocks here at the back speaks for itself. And so I'm not against the people growing small scale or growing for themselves at home. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and I suggest to everybody to be growing cannabis. It's a, it's a, it's a connection that you have with a plant and I've got a deep connection with it. It's a spiritual plant and, and yeah. it helps you in many aspects in your life. Um, to, to, to tell you the truth, um, when it's an unregulated uh, environment, like it's somebody growing just uh, at home, it's, uh, it's seeds that's, that's purchased locally, that's locally been bred or that's been through generations passed on. And, I mean, we in Africa have a history of thousands of years of growing cannabis. You don't have to teach the people how to grow cannabis, uh, but it's not the same thing. Growing three plants or 300 plants is not the same than growing 30,000 to 110,000 per hectare on a commercial scale. It's a completely different ball game, And that's where the misinformation comes in as well because uh, there's a lot of uh, consultants running out there and um, everybody, you, you kick over a rock now and a uh, master grow pops up. It's like a, a dime a dozen, you know? So it's, it's that scenario. Everybody is... Uh, uh, making out like the experts in the industry and and I'm, I'm not blowing my own horn or sitting with a chip on my shoulder but it's been hard work for the last 30 years to be where I am and um, it, it comes with respect and, and and knowledge and I mean you you learn through hard knocks uh, farmers will tell you that as well it's not easy to farm uh, mm -hmm. anybody that says to you it's easy to farm and it's very similar to citrus just like you suggested as well uh, so moving on from home scale uh, growing or personal uh, use mm -hmm. to a commercial scale uh, you got to track everything and um, we mm -hmm. we bring in uh, like i said i mentioned to you we get a genetic supplier agreement and we bring in the genetics that's registered with the international seed bank it comes in with a phytosanitary certificate into the country and it's declared at customs that it came in so it's inspected that you're not bringing any microbials or or fungus or anything into the into the country so that's where it starts then you're multiplying that uh, genetics through uh, cloning or through tissue filtering to get a homogeneous uh, crop. Uh, the big part of this industry is to have a constant, uh, large volume, uh, clean, high, high end product uh, supply. It's uh, similar to the citrus. I mean, our top grade citrus gets exported. We don't see it on our shelves. Uh, we see the choice grade, you know, that's on checkers and pick and pay. Now, it's very similar with cannabis, you know, that. That top end market is not here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a market that's international for um, medicinal uh, purposes, and that's where the money lies as well. So for me, it's um, I, I want everybody to grow. It's going to open up. There'll be hemp permits. It's being issued as well. Um, I know there's a bill that's at Parliament right now that's getting uh, ready to be passed. Uh, we hope uh, for the near future that there'll be cannabis clubs and cannabis dispensaries and it's open and that's the local market. So that's that local production. That's not my field. Uh, like I pointed out to you, um, mm. I, I deal on the larger uh, scale uh, mm. uh, production uh, for export uh, specifically, but yes, um, I hope that answers your question. So it's genetics, it's phytosanitaries, it's traceability straight back to the source uh, barcodes on every single plant uh, with scanners on a software, if a regulatory authority or even uh, 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 security walks in, you can give them a scanner gun. And it doesn't matter if it's a plant or a cutting or product in the fridge. Uh, if they scan that barcode, it'll be clear, transparent, the history of it, when it was planted, where it came from, and where it's going, when it'll be harvested. So everything, everything is tagged. Awesome. Uh, I want to get to one question and then I'll move on to uh, a, a, a guest's uh, question here. I think we've covered it earlier on, but we'll just repeat it for his sake because he did apologize for joining late. Um, now, I just want to find out, speaking about multinationals or, 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 or global companies, right? How do farmers then, are, are, are farmers able to compete, um, you know, in a, in a fair standard or in a fair practice with multinationals who also want to invest in cannabis farming because in the beginning of our conversation you mentioned that you know yes cannabis farming is such a huge buzzword in south africa everybody wants to farm it it's the green gold farmers are investing in cannabis farming diversifying into cannabis farming and also you mentioned mines um you know and and, and pharmaceuticals are also diverting to cannabis farming so now does that create fair competition uh within the south african landscape where you know farmers don't have deep 
pockets and resources like uh, the you know global uh, or big corporates would have. So from an exporting levels, you know, um, and also just regulating the industry, is it a fair uh, field where farmers can um, you know compete equally with multinationals? Uh, yes, I would say it is. Uh, for me, um, yes, there is a big barrier to entry and it's a deep pockets, it's the corporates that's a linear industry. But um, at the end of the day, like I say to you, I've, I've been in many uh, areas in, internationally where this has taken place. And at the beginning, it's, uh, it's everybody jumping on the bandwagon. Like I say, it's, it's, it's pharma, it's the breweries, it's the mining industry and so forth. But uh, uh, three to five years into the industry, it stabilizes. Uh, we two years in now since first licenses have been issued in South Africa. So we're mm -hmm. still sitting on the snake's head, if I can put it that way, uh, where everybody is jumping on a bandwagon. And at the end of the day, it's an overinflated uh, uh, situation where the bubble bursts. And the guys that really know what they're doing, there'll be 10 to maybe 15 larger scale uh, um, producers that controls that area of production that I wouldn't say monopolizes it, but that 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 controls that. It's the same with the citrus industry. You know, like you you have lots of many small scale farmers that produces for a packer maybe, yeah. and um, that ties in with the shipping aspect of it as well. So where do you see yourself in the industry? A lot of people. There's so much scope in this industry. I cannot uh, start to tell you that. Uh, Cannabis touches every single industry that you can name. Uh, so it's so diverse. Um, it's, yeah. You know, you talk about the mining industry. Uh, back in the gold rush, it was not the guys getting into gold mining and made so much money as the guys supplying uh, all the axes and the picks and the sifts and that, you know. So the supply chain for the cannabis industry is a big part of it as well. I mentioned earlier dispensaries as well. So that's all coming. So there's many add-ons and uh um, filtration off from cannabis that's going to happen in South Africa. It's, it's literally a green rush. Um, so even if somebody com um, controls or as a monopoly over that part of the industry, it's not the whole value chain of the industry. Uh, products on the shelves, uh, local products, uh, logos, that's all going to happen. We're going to start um, seeing a lot of brands uh, popping up um, on our local market and for international export as well. So when it comes to product formulation and product development and uh, all of that, I can, like you can hear I'm passionate about what I'm doing and I can go yeah. on about it ever as well for, you know, um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's a massive industry that's here to stay. I would like to see a bigger uh, conventional banking and so forth uh, opening up uh, for the sector as well. So the farmers are not struggling to, to, to have that big barrier to entry on the capital, maybe land yes. bank open up to all the farmers, you know, um, I would like to put that out there uh, to help fund them on it and uh, mitigate uh, that risk. Um, insurance on the crops, you know, we've got to look at all these things in the future. Uh, we don't have it in place yet. Um, mm -hmm. It's coming. I'm glad you mentioned the topic about finance because we've got a question here from Bongani Master Terence. He says, sorry, I'm late, but did you cover the cannabis license costs for a startup, and I believe you did. You said about the license is about twenty three thousand uh, or so. Is that correct? Correct, twenty three thousand nine hundred rand, eight hundred rand. Last time I checked uh, with Sapra, but that's only for your license application to go in. That doesn't mean you get a license. Uh, the compliance is the big part of it. Like um, I mentioned, that's the hard part of it. And um, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, you're talking, you're talking big bucks. It's, uh, it's yeah, people out there. There's all kinds of figures out there. Um, I honestly. Uh, 35 million rand for me uh, touches the the bottom end of uh, production. And you're not talking big scale production, you're talking about half a hectare of production because of the high tech greenhouse that we put up. But it gives you the capability to grow all year round. It doesn't matter what happens on the outside. So we control the whole environment. Uh, conventionally, you would be planting in spring where we're sitting now in September and you'll be harvesting end of March, April. That's one crop for the year, but you're open to contamination and to spray and to cross-pollination and, and, uh, and a lot of headaches, a lot of heartaches uh, that comes with farming, where uh, in a greenhouse situation, a controlled environment, you don't. Uh, you're controlling the photosensitivity on the light cycles. You're cutting the light cycles out. You're controlling the humidity. You're controlling the fertigation, irrigation, and um, everything that goes with it. So in that 
uh, we're dictating to the plants when to flower and how to flower and by super cropping and so forth we upping production as well we're not growing massive plants you're growing smaller plants in smaller cycles so uh, we do six to seven harvests a year compared to one harvest conventionally so yes you're spending the big bucks and the capex and there's that massive barrier to entry but your production is up and your consistency is there and your quality as well because of the environment you're doing it in yeah i think we might have to have you back on now just to talk about the technicalities around production because i'm hearing 35 million just only for half a hectare wow like i mean what could i do with just 35 million there's so many farms i could build you know and here we're just talking about a half a hectare so it sounds quite expensive not sounds it is very expensive yeah. and then you must still go through all the loopholes or sorry the 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 high barriers to entry from a licensing perspective but going back to licensing just how often does one have to um uh, keep up with their license you know do you get a license yearly or does it last for five years, et cetera? Maybe just explain how, you know, for how long do you have the certificate for to trade? Sure. Uh, you got to, you, the upkeep is a, is a five year period, but um, there's um, unannounced inspections um, that uh, gets conducted as well. So it's not just the upkeep on a license fee or that it's to comply, to comply with the regulatory authorities. Um, they can walk onto your site any day. And like I say, you got to be clear and transparent on every single little leaf on site. So we track everything. Uh, when we do, do stalk, uh, we, we track the stalks. When we de leaf, we mm-hmm. track the leaves. Uh, when we, we take moisture content out, when we dehumidify, uh, we weigh wet weight, we weigh dry weight. Uh, everything gets tracked because uh, nothing, uh, they don't want anything to end up on the black market. It's, uh, it's licensed mm-hmm. and it's regulated. You know, so that's a big aspect of it. So if you hear about all the tracking and the weighing and the dehumidification, so forth, all this equipment is costly. So that 35 million rand goes towards, it's not like you think just buying a farm or that. It's actually to set up the building to control the environment, to have the access control on it and um, all the equipment that goes with it and the capability and the salaries and so forth. So, um, yeah, we, we do a proper finance module um, as well in our consortium. So, yeah, I'm the practical guy and I look like this, but um, we have CFOs and that that uh, runs proper finance modules and that and predictions uh, for our clients as well. Wow. Coronel van der Waart, it has been such an awesome uh, conversation that we've had this evening. And hopefully you could join us again where we just unpack other topics around cannabis farming because it seems like, you know, we have a lot of engagement and a lot of interest from our audience regarding this. And unfortunately, we can't take all the questions because now we've run out of time. Um, and we just also don't want to take too much of your time this evening. But um, just as a... Um, as a, f- a final question in closing, you know, is such an investment in cannabis farming justifiable when we need to um, farm food because people are going hungry, you know? Uh, is it justifiable from an expense or capital outlay when we could, sp- when we could be spending that money, you know, in, 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 in growing more uh, grains, more, more foods and, and giving access to, to, to these healthy foods to low-income households? Yeah, I hear your question, and I'm, I'm going to um, answer it twofold. So firstly, uh, cannabis is, uh, is a health uh, supplement, and um, it's necessary as well. Uh, mm-hmm. It's maybe bad to say, but COVID, the, the cannabis industry, good in a way, because uh, there's a bigger demand than there has ever been uh, for cannabis. Uh, we saw that it's uh, essential um, product needed by people to alleviate uh, alleviate, uh, circumstances and um, pain and depression and stress and um, so forth as well. Uh, We saw it across uh, the globe. Um, So for me, it's not just about food, it's about having people's uh, mental health uh, just as good as their body health um, as well. And cannabis plays a big role in that. And uh, for the local market to open up for local production and to have a fair access for local people to it and not just that massive uh, high-end product that's uh, sitting on the shelves in high retail um, internationally is very important as well. So we're definitely going to have that where um, there is smaller communities and co-ops. Um, I've seen some of your previous podcasts about co-ops as well. I um, loved it. Uh, where communities work together and they take it to a central hub, I would suggest for the future where we have central processing 
uh, stations and it doesn't matter how people bring it there if it's uh, on a donkey or on a wheelbarrow or on a bucky <laughs> or on a truck uh, it gets graded like everything else that gets graded you know and it's, yeah. it falls into a category is it for local consumption is it for the export market and that feeds back to the people so um, my second thing i'm going to say to you is that uh, you must remember that uh, cannabis touches uh, everybody's uh everybody's life you know so where have you ever heard of an industry that uh, we can create jobs that badly needed in this country um, um, give investment opportunity for foreigners that brings uh, uh, capital to our shores uh, everybody's here the, the israelis are here the americans are here the germans are everybody's here to grow cannabis on um, on our uh, in our country so we're bringing uh, capital investment opportunities to the country and then we're helping people that badly needs it uh, as a health uh, supplement to have access to it at a fair uh, a, a fair price locally and then we're exporting and we're bringing forex back to the country i mean we, we we're talking uh, a magical industry here i don't know too many industries that touches all of that yeah yeah thank you so much for your time this evening Cornel. um and um yeah it's been fantastic chatting to you and it's great to know that you know there's individuals like yourself uh locally that are so experienced in cannabis farming a topic that we still need to explore quite extensively and i like so many i like the the various uh, opportunities that you've mentioned you know about um creating investment for for cannabis farming more technical expect expertise for cannabis farming looking at around uh, the various ways around licensing and how can we create communities about around cannabis farming and also discussing uh, the importance of what cannabis can do for you from a health perspective so thank you so much for your insights this evening i thoroughly enjoyed our chat and um yeah i wish you a great weekend and a good friday ahead thank you mbali likewise it's been a pleasure Absolutely. We were just speaking to Cornel van der Vaart. If you missed our conversation this evening, please go straight on to YouTube and watch this farming podcast episode 89, where we discuss licensing around cannabis farming in South Africa. Cornel comes with a wealth of information and I'm sure you just don't want to miss this. Hopefully we could get get him back onto the farming podcast to discuss other elements and aspects around cannabis farming so that you at home are informed on the benefits, the pros and cons, why you should farm it from, a, from a, uh, your own private uh, space or from a commercial space and what type of investment you're looking at um, um, when starting cannabis farming and the type of support that exists in South Africa right here locally. I think the key benefits here is that he said that cannabis could be grown anywhere, but a lot um, a lot of um, um, time and patience is needed to understand how the production cycle works. Um, having a technical expert like Cornell to assist you in setting up a cannabis farm. He is the CEO of White Lion Holdings. And um, what I heard is that he also provides consulting services on how to start a commercial cannabis production. Uh, we will leave his details on um, the uh, uh, farming podcast in the specific episode. So reach out to him if you have any further questions and look out for all our social media platforms when we would have Cornell back onto the show. Hopefully he agrees. But thank you so much for watching and supporting the episode uh, this evening. Thank you to JB, to Bongani and all the others that have asked questions. And unfortunately, we couldn't answer all of them tonight because of this limited uh, time frame that we're working under. But this is it for me. Have a fantastic Friday and a great weekend ahead. And I will see you next week, Tuesday, with another awesome guest at 8 p.m. Take care.